Today, we're gonna to introduce proteins. Proteins are an essential macronutrient. What that means is we cannot avoid getting protein in our diets. It's absolutely required for proper function. In this video, we're gonna talk about what is the basic structure of proteins, including the structure of amino acids. We're gonna identify some of the properties that make amino acids different from each other, including whether or not they're essential and whether or not they can be converted into glucose or fatty acids. We're also gonna describe the different functional roles of protein in our body. That'll allow us to think about what would be some of the consequences of not having enough protein in your diet. The recommended daily allowance for protein is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. This was set by the Institute of Medicine in 2005. Now, some people suggest that it should be much higher, maybe even as high as 1.6 grams per kilogram per day. The acceptable macronutrient distribution range for an adult is between 10 and 30%. Consistent with the AMDRs for fats and carbohydrates, this is a very wide range between the lower limits and the upper limits. Proteins can be found in a whole variety of food sources, including animal products such as meat, plant products such as beans, and as supplements such as whey protein. When proteins exist in our bodies, they exist in an equilibrium where they can be existing in our body proteins or broken down into free amino acids. When proteins are digested, they're also broken down into free amino acids. This amino acid pool can be used to make new body proteins, as shown on the right, or those amino acids can be used to generate ATP or to synthesize glucose or fatty acids. Some amino acids are precursors for other nitrogen-containing compounds, things like serotonin, for example. Now, an important thing to remember about proteins is unlike carbohydrates and fats, there is no equivalent of triglycerides or glycogen. There's no neutral pool where we keep amino acids and have them available as needed. When amino acids are present, they're limiting in their free form and exist as proteins in our body. This has important ramifications for protein synthesis. If you look at the image on the left, if you need to make a particular protein, that means you need to have sufficient amounts of all of the constituent amino acids. Shown here on the left in purple is a limiting amino acid, in this case, the essential amino acid lysine. If you only have a small amount of lysine, that dictates how much of that particular protein you can make. If you look at the balanced protein, you can see now that you've had added lysine, you can make more of the protein. That means protein requirements in terms of making new proteins are dependent on all of the essential amino acids, not just one. Within our bodies, proteins play a large variety of roles. They could be enzymes, they could be membrane transporters, they could be transcription factors. These are all important for the normal function of the cell. In fact, most of the functional things that our bodies and our cells can do are done by proteins. However, even though there's tens of thousands of different proteins, almost 50% of all the proteins in your body are of just four proteins, collagen, actin, myosin, and albumin. Collagen is found in skin, hair, and other connective tissues. Actin and myosin are present in our muscles. Albumin comprises of more than 60% of all the proteins in our blood. What that means is if we are limiting in the amount of dietary protein we intake, the first things we're gonna notice are related to decreases in collagen, actin, myosin, or albumin. So let's go through some examples of what that might look like. There are two major diseases of protein malnutrition. Hoshirakor is when you have a deficiency of protein, but not necessarily a deficiency in calories. This is rare in Western societies, but is quite common in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some of the phenotypes include a distended abdomen, fatty liver, hair and teeth loss, anorexia, and developmental difficulties. This is distinct from marasmus. That's a deficiency in both protein and calories. So let's talk about why some of the phenotypes associated with Quashirakor happen. These are related to the loss of those four abundant proteins I introduced a moment ago. For example, if you don't have actin or myosin, which are very abundant in muscle, you're going to lose muscle mass. In fact, Remember, we don't have an equivalent of glycogen from protein, which means if we need amino acids for other things, we generally are gonna break down muscle to provide those amino acids. That results in muscle loss. Collagen is important for connective tissue. That's why hair loss and nails falling out is a phenotype associated with Quashirakor. In the case of albumin, albumin is an important osmolite in our blood. The presence of those proteins in our blood keeps water in our blood. If you remove that osmolite, water will traffic into the tissues. That's why you can get swelling, including the distended abdomen that is characteristic of Quashirakor. There are four ways to think about protein structure. First is the primary sequence. 
For example, methionine might be followed by arginine, might be followed by tryptophan. Whereas another protein might go methionine, arginine, glutamine. The sequence matters, and the sequence dictates both the function of the protein and how it's shaped. The sequence will then fold into what we call secondary structures. This includes helices and sheets. Those secondary structures then fold over each other to form what's called the tertiary structure. This is the complicated, involuted, folded structure of any given monomeric protein. Some proteins combine with other proteins to form what's known as quaternary structures. This involves multiple individual polypeptides folding together to form a multimeric structure consisting of multiple proteins. Every protein is unique, and every protein has a different tertiary or quaternary structure. So what that means is not only are their functions different, but how we digest and absorb them can be very different. Here's an example. You may be familiar with supplements such as casein, casein hydrolysate, and whey. These are very common dietary supplements. But because casein and whey have very different protein structures, they're digested at very different rates. If you compare the blue line to the red line, what you can see is that whey protein is digested quite rapidly. The amino acids from whey are released into our blood very quickly, shown on the y-axis. Casein, on the other hand, is digested much more slowly. Both casein and whey have about the same amount of essential amino acids, but the structure of them dictates that they are digested at very different rates. Casein being slow-acting, whey being fast-acting. Casein hydrolysate, on the other hand, shown here in white, C-A-S-H, is a protein that is now partially broken down. It is casein that is partially digested. You can see by partially digesting it and by breaking down some of that tertiary and secondary structure, now casein hydrolysate is digested and absorbed much more similarly to whey than to the native casein. Again, the protein structure matters for digestion and absorption. Proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. The structure of an amino acid in general is shown on a right. It's got an amino group, a carboxyl group, and shown in R is a side chain. The side chain is what differs between the different amino acids. There's 20 different side chains. Amongst those 20 amino acids, you can categorize them in several ways. Shown here is categorization of amino acids based on whether they're essential for most people or dispensable or non-essential for most people. You can also break amino acids down in terms of can they be converted into glucose, the glucogenic amino acids, or can they be converted into ketone bodies and fats, the ketogenic amino acids. Some of them are both glucogenic and ketogenic because they can be converted into either. Remember, protein is an essential nutrient because we cannot make all 20 amino acids. Some amino acids must be obtained from our diet. Therefore, each amino acid can be broken down into a nutritionally essential amino acid, a nutritionally dispensable amino acid, or sometimes a conditionally essential amino acid. A conditionally essential amino acid still must be obtained by the diet, but maybe not in all people. There's some conditions which make it essential. PKU is a disease that affects about 1 in 12,000 people. Normally, phenylalanine is converted into tyrosine to the activity of an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. This is a reaction shown on the top. Now, phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. Nobody can make phenylalanine. It's required in the diet for every single human. However, if you have sufficient amounts of phenylalanine and you have active phenylalanine hydroxylase, you can make tyrosine from phenylalanine. That makes tyrosine a dispensable amino acid, while phenylalanine is essential. However, it means that tyrosine is conditionally essential on both the activity of phenylalanine hydroxylase and the presence of phenylalanine. So if you had a person that was deficient in phenylalanine, you would find that they will also be deficient in tyrosine. Now, people with PKU, they are unable to convert phenylalanine into tyrosine. So now both those amino acids become essential. They need to get dietary requirements of both phenylalanine and tyrosine. Furthermore, the breakdown of phenylalanine in our body goes through tyrosine. You have to convert phenylalanine to tyrosine, and then tyrosine gets further metabolized into energy. That means if you don't have active phenylalanine hydroxylase, the phenylalanine has nowhere to go, and it can build up. Therefore, patients with PKU have to carefully monitor the amount of phenylalanine they ingest. They need phenylalanine because it's still an essential amino acid, but they can't have too much because the body can't dispense of it. Therefore, people with PKU must be on very specific diets that are low but not zero in phenylalanine, high in tyrosine, often with supplementation. Again, PKU is relatively rare, affecting 1 in 12,000 people, and it's screened at birth in all 50 states. Another way by which you can classify amino acids, aside from essentiality, is what can they be converted to? 
Recall, I said that amino acids can be converted into glucose or into ketone bodies. The ones that can become glucose are known as glucogenic amino acids, whereas the ones that can become fatty acids or ketone bodies are known as ketogenic amino acids. Again, each of the 20 amino acids has a different metabolic pathway, which dictates whether they're glucogenic or ketogenic. In summary, proteins are essential for a whole variety of bodily functions. This includes hormones, enzymes, transporters, and immune functions. However, there's only a small number of proteins that comprise most of the proteins in our body. Therefore, when there's protein deficiencies, it's those proteins that dictate those phenotypes. Proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids connected by peptide bonds. The variety of those different amino acids dictates the structure of the protein, including its folding. Proteins have very diverse structures. This strongly affects their digestibility. Recall the example between casein and whey. Finally, some amino acids, which are generally not essential, can become essential in some conditions. We talked about PKU as one example, but another example might be if there's high demand. Arginine, for example, is dispensable in adults, but essential in newborns. That's because of the high growth demand in newborns. Protein is an essential macronutrient. We must obtain protein from our diet. But how much protein does an individual need? Well, that's a tougher question. Individuals vary on their protein requirements, depending on their activity level and the particular proteins they eat, the quality thereof. Understanding what individual protein requirements are is an important aspect of providing effective dietary advice.